chill out everybody and use some common sense and some brotherly or sisterly love and we'll be all right. Yeah. That's what some hippie bullshit that I yeah. see. <laughs> it's all right. I know better. Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to another episode of Damn Well Better with the lovable Iron Beaver. And this is a podcast where we talk to real-ass people about their real-ass lives and kind of start a health evolution revolution. Now, the fitness industry was one of the hardest hit in the COVID pandemic. Fitness, by its very nature, it's close, it's physical, and it utilizes a lot of heavy respiration. So gyms and group training were out. And they still are out in places that fail to take a united and scientific approach to this disease. While some fit pros publicly flamed out, embraced conspiracy theories, and spent their lockdown time crying about mental health and the government, there were plenty of others who were learning new technology and inventing ways to reach their clients without putting everyone at risk. Now, whether you like it or not, this industry just leveled up and totally evolved. So I sat down with four different coaches, some who have brick and mortar gyms, some who coach online, and some who do both, to see how they feel about the industry changing overnight and how they had to change with it. Without further ado, enjoy my chats with Art O'Connor, Lindy Valentin, Noel Brand, and KP. Hey guys, what's up? I am sitting here with Art O'Connor of Wukar Fit, and we're talking to fitness professionals about how they've had to pivot during this epidemic. Now, for those of you who don't know Art, he's about nine feet tall. He's a slender man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he has a huge, awesome punk rock spirit. He is a cyclist, and he trains endurance athletes mm-hmm. how to be strong. And if you've ever had the pleasure of being able to sit through one of his seminars, seminars talks, his talks, fireside chats, <laughs> then you would know he delivers a very important line, which is, do you want to say it or should I? Stronger is better. <laughs> Stronger is better. And nobody ever wished they were weaker. Yes. <laughs> so welcome, Art. Welcome to the Iron Beaver Damn Well Better podcast. <laughs> Thanks for um, having me. I'm super stoked to be here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet you are. So first things first, why don't you tell my listeners who you are a little better than I did and what you were doing pre-COVID? Yeah, I've uh, been a, pretty much a lifelong athlete of one form or another. My business, uh, Wukar Fit, I, I train primarily cyclists to be stronger. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to work with some pretty high-level athletes. I was actually supposed to be getting on a plane today to go to Tokyo for the Olympics. Uh, wow. But as we're going to talk about, things yeah. have changed. The world's a different place. But I've always been uh, very into strength training, and it's always served me really well in a variety of different sports. I started out as a ski racer. I went to school on a track and field scholarship, and then I transitioned into endurance sports uh, right after college, wanting to try something different. Um, but through that time, I've always had a pretty good strength training practice, and it's always been something I've kind of kept to myself as kind of my, my secret sauce, or secret <laughs> weapon, so to speak. And about 10 years ago, I was working as a stockbroker. Didn't have to wear a suit and tie, but business professional kind of stuff. And very rigid, not very fulfilling. And I just found myself like wanting to do more. And like, there's gotta be more, more to life than you know reading quarterly reports. And I decided basically to quit my job with no real plan other than <laughs> I'm gonna start training people somehow. And, you know, I found the Jim Jones program and went through that certification. I've done some other certifications since then, you know, and just really spent a good two years kind of taking my enthusiasm, but really drilling down on the, uh, on the knowledge part of it and, you know, more, you know, how to coach, mm-hmm. you know, and how to, how to kind of get this knowledge that I accumulated over the years in my head, but, you know, how to get it out there and, and make There's it accessible. There's a total difference between knowing what you're doing and being able to coach somebody to do it. Exactly. 
you know, fortunately, I have a very supportive partner who kind of made it financially possible for me to kind of chase these dreams for a while when I wasn't making any money. You know, I kind of found my niche with, with, with mountain bikers and I've, you know, built a pretty decent business o- over the years. That was kind of, that rug was pulled out from under me <laughs> and you Fuck and yeah, everybody else yeah. <laughs> in, in March of this year. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and that's, I guess, what we're going to talk about is how how we've pivoted and, and trying to make well, things work. You also do screen printing too, right? You know, we had a big music festival that we were supposed to be doing shirts for this year that mm-hmm. got canceled. We do a lot of event stuff. Those yes, have all been canceled. Cancel, cancel, Bar and cancel. restaurant stuff. They're yep. not spending money on t-shirts canceled. and hoodies right now. <laughs> so it's really forced me to kind of reinvent myself. Um, it's been interesting. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's in a lot of ways, it's been kind of fun. It's easy to get into a routine and think it's going to be this way forever. And, you know, sometimes the universe sometimes just kind challenge. of smacks you upside the head and Level says, up. <laughs> yeah, time to do something, time to change it up. So, so initially, how did, how did COVID affect your business? You know, initially, like everybody else, we, you know, I wasn't thinking it was that big of a deal. Like, all right, we'll close the gym for a month mm-hmm. and then we'll be back to normal. We have a number of doctors that train at, at the facility here and we, we talked to them and got their input. And we just decided that the right thing to do is, you know, let's shut things down. So you actually and listened to professionals. We did. Well. Yeah, science. Amazing. You know, I, I mean, my degree is in exercise physiology, so I yeah. do have a science background. <laughs> and I understand that science, you know, works and it does change. Yeah. Yeah, and a good scientist wants to be proven wrong. Yeah. You know, and I think a good coach wants to be proven wrong. You know, that's been, you know, one of the biggest things that's helped me in my coaching career is, you know, seeking out knowledge of, from other people and other sources. When I started, when I came up with this idea of I want to train endurance athletes and mountain bikers specifically, there really wasn't anybody doing that. So I had to go and look to other sports to figure out how, how to how to train, you know, how to implement a strength program into this sport. Yeah. You know, from that background, and I think any good coach thinks that way. You know, there, we're always looking for, you know, other ways to kind of kind of solve the problem and in other ways to approach things and so for us it was an easy decision to look at the data and look at the science and say all right well we're going to shut the we're going to shut this down our you know the health of our clients and athletes is paramount yeah you know we don't want anybody getting sick here so let, let's shut it down. But, you know, it's only going to be, you know, it's going to be two to four weeks. Huh. <laughs> yeah. And I kind of looked at it as a vacation because we're, we're extremely busy here in the, in the winter. Mm-hmm. And we had just finished our winter program. I, I work with the NICA, the, the high school mountain bike league. And so I had 50 high school athletes here all winter long. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a lot juggling that many kids. Oh, yeah. um, so I was like ready for a break. And so I was like, ah, oh, it'd be nice to have a month off. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But then, How you know, the month came later? and went. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, what are we going to do? How are we going to fix this? So what did you guys do to kind of keep up? Well, so I started doing Zoom sessions with, with some of my clients. I started using the Train Heroic app for my high school athletes that, you know, still wanted to continue the strength train, but, you know, couldn't couldn't come in the gym. I mean, technically we're open now, but we're not doing any group stuff. We're just doing private sessions. Mm-hmm. And a lot of my clients don't, they don't feel ready to come back yet either. Yeah. I don't train exclusively, you know, young cyclists. I've got some older athletes and, and people who know that they're mortal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and they, they're, they're comfortable. The, the zoom has worked out really well for them and they're happy doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're getting really good work done with that too. You know, it's their their training really hasn't suffered at all. I have an athlete that I coach. I've always coached remotely. Who lives in uh, Santa Cruz, and you know, he kind of put together what he could. Mm-hmm. And like, he has a barbell set that he doesn't have the same amount of weight on either side. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like he just you know he has a forty five and a thirty five, and but you know, and he you just switch. Yeah. See, so, that's, well, that's a very Jim Jones mentality. Yeah, like I mean, hey, this is yeah, an always, asymmetric load. Yeah, you know, life isn't always going to work out for you, so yeah, so work around it. Yeah, so he's making it work, and he, you know, and he's doing, you know, he's doing kettlebell swings with a backpack because you know, try to find a kettlebell right now to buy. <laughs> you know? We were lucky. We just got a bunch of kettlebells by some weird guy on the side of the road way up north, <laughs> and it was probably about a month before everything went to hell. Right, and we're like, thank God we did that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're they're tough to find. If you find them, you're gonna pay through the nose. <laughs> yeah. Now, so would you consider at this point? Are you 
kind of thriving? Are you surviving or are you sinking? In, in this gym, we're a small kind of private gym. Mm -hmm. But that said, a lot of my business was uh, classes. So like groups of like five to six people. That's completely gone away. Um, yeah, I think I'm probably doing better than most. You know, and all the train. there's only three of us that, you know, three trainers at this gym. And, you know, we're kind of all in the same boat, just figuring it out as we go. In an ideal world, what do you think would have helped keep your business going? I mean, in an ideal world, without going down the political rabbit hole, you know, I think if we had some leadership that would have taken this a little more serious and we would have had a, a, a stricter lockdown in the beginning and we stuck to it for, you know, if you look at other countries around the world that, have, that seem to have gotten on top of this, that's what they did, you know. And lockdown that's, and masks. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think if we would have had a more strict and faster response early on, it would have, you know, maybe we would have been like, you know, Korea or, you know, ideally like New Zealand. Yeah, you know? <laughs> <laughs> ideally. <laughs> yeah, but you know, there's a lot of factors that go into that. It's easy to blame, you know, the politicians and everybody about that. But, you know, there's also, you know, the people that just won't wear a mask and, you know, for whatever reason, mm -hmm. you know, and there's the whole anti-science vector, which I don't understand right. at all. I think people were very scared of this. Mm -hmm. Um, but then once certain outlets were saying, don't be scared of this, it's nothing, people began to think differently and behave differently. And then all of a sudden we weren't all on the same team against the virus anymore. We were against each other. Yeah. And that just, I think that broke down. Well, I, th I think it's a lot like starting a fitness program of somebody that we've seen it a million times. Somebody comes in, they're all gung ho yeah. <laughs> and they're super strict with everything. You know, they cut out everything. They don't eat any sugar. They don't, you know, they're eating paleo or yeah. uh, keto or life. whatever. You know, like they, t they change everything all at once and they're really good about it for about two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then they're like, well... Abs don't really exist, so I'm just not even going to try to get abs now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and I think we took the same approach with COVID of like, well, yeah, this is we did this. It, it was really hard, and we did this really hard for a month. But yeah, I'm ready to not do it's this time anymore. Time for my cookie. It's yeah. Time for my treat. Yeah, I want I want to go to the mall. You know, I want to go to a restaurant. You know. Yeah. Having everybody like in leadership positions be upfront of like, mm -hmm. look, this is going to really suck for four to six weeks but if we don't do this now it's going to get away from us and we're going to be where we are yeah right now like when we all know where that is you know people didn't understand the implications of this because it's like we said this it's evolving the science yeah. is changing it's true most of our leadership really don't understand science no and and Kind of the willful ignorance is what really annoys me like if you look at these commissions that they put together of to reopen it's all business people yeah. and politicians. There's no doctors or scientists or immunologists. You know, there's no, none of that are, are reflected in these people that are making these decisions. Yeah. We thought about trying to stay open because, you know, we are a small private gym. It's pretty easy for us to wipe everything down because initially it was, you know, you, it's, it's through touch. You know, if yeah. you touch something and then touch your nose, you're going to get it. You're yeah. going to touch your eye. <laughs> And so that's how we were approaching it. So mm -hmm. even, you know, when we first started hearing about this, we, we, you know, we keep a pretty clean gym anyway. So we just stepped that up. We, you know, we, we started wiping everything down with alcohol and, you know, mm -hmm. we, we were wearing gloves while we were doing that. You know, and we thought we could stay on top of it doing that. But then as it became clear that it was more of an airborne thing, then we had to shift and, and think pivot, about, well, pivot, okay, pivot. we can't have big groups of people in here and, and have people be safe. When we're training in here, we have the doors open, we have the fans on, we're trying to keep air circulating. Coaches are wearing masks. It's up to the clients whether they want to or not. Mm -hmm. And most of my clients have been wearing a mask you know, when they're in here, except for, you know, if they're doing like a 500 meter row, yeah. they're taking the mask off their yeah. back because that's, <laughs> that's it's hard true. enough. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that's just, that's the psycho who wants the extra challenge. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's interesting for me to watch a lot of health professionals and seeing which ones adapt and which ones sink. Mm -hmm. And I think most of the people that sink, they're not adapting. Right. They're not using Zoom. They aren't getting flyers out there. They aren't doing sessions in the park, mm -hmm. things like that to keep you know members going or providing another service. Yeah. 
for their clients. It's mostly, oh, if I can't do this exact workout in this exact space the way I'm accustomed to doing it, it's done. Mm -hmm. And I feel like people who have survived and are still surviving are either providing another service or utilizing, you know, Zoom and apps and or doing something. Not to go down, but like the, the Ivanka Trump thing of like, just do something else. Yeah. There's actually a lot of truth. To, I mean, yeah. I don't think that <laughs> it can be she's necessarily self-aware, but it, it kind of is true. I mean, I've had to change my screen printing business to adapt to this. It forced me to build a website and to start selling original designs through my website, yeah. you know, which is something I should have been doing all along in the first place, but I never got around to it because I didn't need to. Yeah. Frankly, it wasn't something I wanted to learn. Yeah. Like I'm not the most tech savvy guy in the world and like, you know, to, I didn't know how to use Zoom. I didn't, I didn't want to know how to use yeah. Zoom. <laughs> None of us did. Oh my God, I didn't either. <laughs> One thing that's been kind of surprising to me is like seeing like the gyms and like the coaches and stuff that have been really struggling with this, that haven't figured out how to move forward. Because when you think about it, you know, as, as athletes, this is kind of what we do. Like we're, all we do is train to think on our feet and to yeah. adapt to overcome a situation. You know, one of my fav all time favorite quotes is the Mike Tyson quote of like, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Yep. <laughs> exactly. I mean, this is exactly what this, I mean, like the gym, you know, in sport in general just teaches you to be able to think on your feet and mm -hmm. change tactics. You know, like, it, you know, exactly. you're in combat sports, you know, if you're up against a component that has a kick or a punch that you've never seen, you have to figure out how the hell am I going to, you know, over, overcome this and, yeah. and not get my clock cleaned by this. It's almost like this is your ethos playing out in real life. Yeah, and this is what you've been training for and basing yeah. your entire this life on. This is the on. big game. And now that it's here, <laughs> yeah, you're completely, the big race. yeah, you're completely unprepared for it and unable to adapt and, and change. We all just got punched in the fucking face. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There is, I can't. This is the biggest punch that's ever happened in my lifetime. Yeah. You know, hopefully it's, there isn't a bigger one oh, out there. Yeah, I don't even, <laughs> we'll just take it one, one hit at a time. Yeah, basically. so it's, you know, it's just, it's about resilience and just mm -hmm. like, yeah, all right, I got knocked down, but all right, I'm going to get back up. Yeah. Think of what it would, what it would be like if you owned a typewriter factory, like in yeah. the late nine, you know, late eighties, yeah. early nineties, when word processors came out, like, well, shit, yeah. <laughs> now what do I do? And I, yes, <laughs> I, I remember that time. I, I was in junior high and maybe the very beginning of high school. And it was cool to have a typewriter that had the, the whiteout option. You can go back and erase a few, mm -hmm. you know, letters. Can you imagine? Yeah. Well, I mean, Kodak, who's no longer in business, they actually have the patents for digital cameras. And yeah. refused to do it. Like they, they clung to film. Uh huh. And they died. Yeah. Like they, they invented digital photography. Yeah. And they were, and they couldn't <laughs> even see it. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, oh, yeah. film, 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 film. Like, yeah, how'd that work out for you? Exactly. <laughs> There's times where you do, you have to let, let things go. You have to kill your darlings. Yeah. You're going to be. I mean, hopefully the future of, of training isn't on Zoom. But I think part of it will be, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, if that's if it is on Zoom, then that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to go back and work in a cubicle. Yeah, <laughs> you know? exactly. You know what I, mean? I think, you know, I think the future of fitness is we're going to pass this. Everything's going to be fine. I mean, I, I really do believe we're going to figure it out. We're going to get mm -hmm. a vaccine going. It's going to be fine. But I think what we could learn from this is that in a crisis, there are all these other options and directions that we can go now. Right. You know, because it might not be COVID in the future. It might be, you know, I hate to say this, but another war or some sort of could be financial an alien invasion. crisis. What? An alien invasion. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the Navy released a UFO video and said <laughs> UFOs are real and it did, hasn't even made the news. People That's how like, crazy whatever. the world is right now. Oh, yeah, I'm okay. too busy with this Wayfair <laughs> cabinet stuff to yeah. worry about that. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, it, well, exactly. It, it really could be anything and and if we don't have that adaptability that's it he you know humans are done yeah so i yeah wow that's a big metaphor i guess <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> anyway well art i thank you very much for sitting down and having this chat with me yeah thank you um i really appreciate it and yeah i hope that your business continues to grow and that once this 
this shit show <laughs> is over, that you know you can get those people back in and get groups back in. Because I think I think we will. It might not happen until next year, but none nothing is permanent. You know, right. new normal is a new normal. And I think if we're going to be masking up, I think it's going to be during flu season. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that wearing masks and staying 10 feet away from each other is the future. Right. For It's just the present. Well, I wish you the best luck. Thank you. You too. So. <laughs>
and repair equipment that we've got to clean because some of it got wet too. Replace the hot water heater. That wasn't even when they passed out the stimulus checks yet. The only thing that saved us was our tax return. Mm -hmm. Shortly after that, the motor on our AC unit went out. And so <laughs> then we had to replace that too, which was good times to be had. But at least it wasn't the entire air conditioner. That's what I was eternally grateful for. I'm like, okay, we don't need, that's, that was my dreaded thought was, yes. this thing is dead and I am done for. <laughs> yeah. I'm, it's over. <laughs> yep. You know that you've been through a lot of stress when you're like, was that even it? I don't remember <laughs> and I don't care. <laughs> I find myself saying that kind of shit all the time. Like, I don't even know if that was all of it. Like, I have to stop and think of, like, which disasters happened when, which were pre-COVID, yeah. which were post-COVID. What are we yeah. even doing here? <laughs> what, I don't even know what stage of COVID we're in right now. <laughs> or disaster. It feels like it's been three years, and we've oh, only God. gotten halfway, a well, little more than halfway through this year. <laughs> yeah. So what about um, online? Have Were any of your clients shift to online easily? So what we've slowly started progressing, one of my clients, we started online training with her and then bless her, she got COVID. <gasps> yeah, she, she's got COVID. And so we just kind of set her aside and we're like, okay, we'll come back and revisit when you're recouped and you're feeling better and we can handle this right now. If you have COVID where you are symptomatic, mm -hmm. people kind of get the notion that because because they say you have a mild case, that the symptoms are mild. But if you have symptoms, they generally are not very mild. No, a mild case means you're not dead. That's exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I mean, they could say, oh, asymptomatic, but it really means like all they had is a runny nose or felt a little mm -hmm. under the weather. That's kind of asymptomatic. But a mild case is I have fiberglass in my lungs and uh, I don't know if I should go to the ER to get oxygen. Like that's what yeah. a mild case feels like. Or yeah, so I've been told. Well, she's one of those people that has an extremely high pain tolerance. is very, very determined. And so I knew when she was like, first she, she when we first talked, she's like, I just got a really bad cold, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, a few days later, she's like, nope, I tested positive for COVID. And I'm trying to get a hold of the doctor and get medicine because these symptoms are, I'm dying. Out of control, yeah. I was like, yeah, okay, no. If you, if you are like that over with it, then it's, and I knew it was serious, but to hear her just be like, mm -mm, it's yeah. not happening. And I've got one person right now. She's in a very unique situation, this client, where she almost, she leaves home like maybe once or twice a month to go grocery shopping where she's constantly working from home. And so for her, we've negotiated a deal for in-person training because with just one person, we can keep the social distancing. She's got a trip planned soon. And we've already talked about how she's going to quarantine for two weeks and I'll write online programming for her. And it's a good experience for me because I've never really done a whole lot of that before. And I think that's kind of where I'm going to end up transitioning for a while until this is over, is focusing on that aspect of the business. And I'm very lucky that I have clients that are also friends that are like, please use this as guinea pigs. I know my clients well enough to know, okay, I need to scale this movement to this for them, or I need to change it to this for them. There's not a video out there that makes me happy. So I hop on my little YouTube channel and I report a private <laughs> Perfect. Link. And yeah. they get my goofy ass self out there. <laughs> it's just like, hey, it's me. I'm in your house. Yeah. I know you hate burpees. This is how we're going to roll today. <laughs> in a way, I think this is forcing all of the trainers to actually customize their training better. That's a big thing is a lot of people are just like, oh, I'm going to go hop on YouTube and do all these videos and I'm perfectly fine. No, I no. love you. I need, I need to see your form. You're watching somebody on YouTube do this, but you may not be getting a full explanation. They don't have your body frame, period. Yeah. And they may not have any injuries you have. There's, there's a whole thing that goes into fitness that you have to observe as a fitness coach or a personal trainer. You have to have that presence. And I think Zoom and Skype and all of those are really great in that respect that you can have your client be like, okay, we're going to log on here at this time. I'm going to sit and watch you do this and I'm going to walk you through it. And this is what's going to happen. And I think that's tremendously effective, especially for people who are not aware of their own bodies, who weren't athletes before that don't have that sense because I can safely say I had no clue. And it took somebody being there as soon as I made a mistake, Hey, 
you need to correct this. You need to get back in your heels, widen your feet up, turn your toes a little bit, your knees are caving in, just be on me. To yeah. the point where now I have that awareness, but that was a learned behavior for me. So now, now that we are <laughs> how many months into this shit <laughs> with no end in sight? <laughs> yes, the numbers keep climbing. We all keep crying. It's okay. <laughs> and yeah, everybody's ripping off their masks and opening things up. But you know, okay, okay. That's, that's where we are. That's yeah, what we're that's doing. Good. That's fine. So how, how is business now? Are you starting to get traction again or... We're still kind of in a rocky point, but it's slowly getting better. And I'm getting to the point now where I feel comfortable enough with the friends that have let me use them as guinea pigs that I'm probably going to push into the online coaching a little bit more and see how that works. But I also have this hold back right now of uh, the school that my kids are going to attend. Have not figured out a plan yet. (gasps) Oh no. I just registered mine for school today. And, <laughs> and seriously, they did so what we do, we have options. So I signed them up Good. for the first semester online only. And I figure if everything's cool, they'll have no problem going back to school. But if it's a shit show and everything explodes, no yes. transitioning necessary. So we're very lucky. It was so stressful though. So I can't even imagine how stressed out you are right now about it. You feel like it's this stupid balancing act. So because I don't know how school is going to go for the kids. I don't know how you can't make a plan to go for me. Yeah. So yeah. in the next month or so, I can figure out how to amp up the online coaching. I just, I don't feel comfortable because this business right now is in my home yes. with my kids. Yes. And I have an autoimmune disease. I have hypothyroidism. My husband has celiac disease. So he has an autoimmune disease. If we were in kind of you know, a more ideal world, what could you have used to help you out so that you're not wondering if your business is going to survive? If there had been more financial support from the government to everyone, if this had just, if everything had shut down significantly sooner, instead of fumbling around going, oh, this is going to be minor. We're only going to have 15 cases. Everything's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. No. If there had been an immediate shutdown, this is what we're doing. We're going to provide financial support for people and for small businesses. The fact that there are businesses that are making huge amounts of money that got crazy bailouts in this Mm -hmm. thing and still laid off employees right and left. Yes. Makes me so mad while I'm sitting here watching smaller businesses around here shudder and go under. It's, it's awful. Once upon a time, there (laughs) was at least some sort of pandemic plan in place before our current situation and it got ignored. And for me, that is the great travesty. If it had just been, don't live in denial, don't ignore experts, go out there, shut everything down, mask up, get people on better hygiene, start supporting your small businesses. They should have put better better regulations on those loans that they put out, period. And so much of this has been politicized. Yes. You can't make this about businesses. You have to make this about people surviving. And I think that in the long run should have been the focus from the get-go. And if it had been, instead of leaning more towards corporate bailout, I love the fact that everybody got a stimulus check, but that one, focus on it being a handout, and two, it's not a handout. Everybody's flipping been paying taxes forever. That's not a handout. No. This government is here to take care of its people. They're excited about $1,200, and that's a drop in the bucket. Yes. It is a drop in the bucket, especially when you make it for one month and being like, okay, everything's going to be fine It's like, now. oh, hey, I, I covered my mortgage this month. Cool. <laughs> People aren't using this to spend, to go out into the economy. They're putting it in savings. They're paying bills. They're just trying to survive. And if that's all you're doing, then everything else is going to fall apart. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think in the long run, if the government had been more proactive and been more, okay, we're here for the citizens of this nation. Let's put money into this. Let's go step over here and do this. Let's take care of people. It, it would have been better in the long run for everybody. And I don't think we would be, be seeing the ridiculous spikes in numbers that we're seeing now. I think we, we would be able to start opening up safely. And I don't think that's the case now. 
you know, if everyone put their partisan shit down for a second and said, hey, this is a disease and it's dangerous, but instead we had to make it a a liberal and conservative war or whatever the hell is happening. Oh Cause I don't, I don't even understand what's happening anymore. <laughs> All I know is everybody's lost their damn minds well, about everything. Oh, I think there's, that- you know what? I, I think there is a point of time where human beings just can't take mental stress. And I think that's about six weeks. <laughs> everybody <laughs> after Tiger King, everybody slowly fell off the rails and I don't even know what the oh fuck happened. God. <laughs> it, it just it, it all went downhill from there and the fact that it there's this blatant disregard for facts for science for any kind of experts in any field at all and people are more dependent on well joe bob's brother's second cousin twice removed said this or well this meme online said this no. exactly what do you see for the future of weight lift me up coaching and your home gym and all of that. I think this opens up actually a really great opportunity for most gyms. And I don't think a lot of people really see it that way yet because there is a whole world of people out there who don't like group fitness classes, who don't like to be in a crowded gym, who would rather just set stuff up at home and be coached in their homes or participate in an, a group class from a distance. And I think that that can translate into a whole other field and open fitness up to so many more people who can't drive to a certain location or who have certain mental health conditions where they just can't be in a packed building. Yeah. Surrounded. High anxiety, agoraphobia. Yes, exactly. And that to me is an amazing thing. And I also think there's an added benefit too, of like you said, this makes it more personal. And honestly, that's the way it should have been in the first place, but yeah. plus, there's too many people in the fitness industry that just aren't. And it frustrates me. I don't want it to go back to that kind of neglect where people walk away from gyms saying, I just didn't feel like I was getting the attention. If you were shelling out 200, 250 bucks a month, somebody should have been giving you that flipping oh, attention. See, for real, for real. So it, for me- It's like, in actually you could bring fitness to the people, finally. There's an inherent neglect to a lot of people that are poor, that are of different skin color, that are of different abilities. And it makes it hard for them they don't feel welcome in fitness. And I think this gives them a a good segue to be like, okay, we can do this for you and you can do it at your own home or you can come here and do this and let's work around what you need financially. The movement for more diversity within gyms was just sort of starting to gain momentum. I've been the big girl at the gym. Mm -hmm. And I've had a lot of issues with that because I felt the fitness industry was so unaccepting. I started working out in a gym at my job right at the end of my night shift when nobody would be in there and I could just hide away in this small little area and Mm -hmm. do my cardio and do my push-ups and do my sit-ups until I felt skinny enough to go to a big (sighs) gym. Yes, I'm able-bodied, I'm white. I can't even imagine what somebody else experienced that is in another body that is completely different from mine. You're finding ways to challenge yourself and you think in the end, it's gonna be good for the industry. I think it will be as long as the industry takes note and and does what it should because ideally the fitness industry is supposed to be to serve its clients, to provide them their goals. With COVID, you're having to think outside the box and you're having to take into account people's mental health, their stress level, what they are or aren't capable of doing that day. And it's not in this vacuum every anymore where you just think that everybody's okay and it's fine. It, nobody's okay or fine for the most part right now. <laughs> Truth. I want it to be more open and accepting and adaptive instead of this set in stone curls for the girls kind of thing. Boiled chicken yes, meal perhaps. No, oh, and the blend, Put it no. in a blender. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I, I, want the, 
I want the fitness industry to to get to where it should have always been. I like that. I love that attitude. I love seeing that so many people are using this as a positive springboard to the future of health and fitness. And I appreciate it. And I think you are doing really fantastic things. Fantastic. (laughs) Yeah. Hey, so now I have with me Noel Brand of Breda Strength and Conditioning. I met Noel through the Jim Jones community. I really love his attitude of constant evolution, constant betterment, constant positivity. And I wanted to see the difference of how gyms in other parts of the world have fared as compared to gyms in the United States. So welcome, Noel. Would you let everybody know who the hell you are and what it is you do? Yeah, sure. Uh, Thanks for having me on, Liz. So my name is Noel Brand. Uh, I live in the Netherlands. I am the co-owner and uh, head coach of Breda Strength Conditioning. I am the co-owner. I, I run the gym along with my amazing wife, Sana. Um, next year will be our 10-year anniversary. We have an awesome facility. We moved uh, a year ago. It's about 3,000 square feet. And it's been a, a, a special time. It's been an intense time the last special. couple of months. Yes, yes. Mom <laughs> calls me special too. So it's been a, it's been a, a special time. Before I, I became a full-time co-owner and strength and conditioning coach. I was with the Royal Netherlands Marine Corps. I was in the Marine Corps for 14 years. Uh, I was deployed to Afghanistan. And in the last couple of years, my last year with the Royal Netherlands Marine Corps, I got the chance to um, use some of the the budget that they put away for veterans and and people that are leaving the service. And and I went to to Salt Lake and uh, I became a Jim Jones fully certified instructor from what I remember correctly, that's where you and I met, even yeah. though we didn't meet. We didn't know we it. The, <laughs> no, but we were in the same room while I was doing my internship to, to <laughs> intern there. But I was doing my internship while you were also in the other class that was in the same we room. Had, while we I was had doing, a special yeah. women's jujitsu night there. Um, they were trying to get some more fighters into the gym. Yeah, yeah, it was great. And then I was, uh, I was blasting hardcore music. And you were, I remember because it was like the birthday of the Royal Netherlands Marine Corps. And I remember the workout. They had to do a team versus team. And they had to do uh, like calories on the air bike and bird pull-ups and stuff like that. But every time you, ha- you would switch, your team would switch from the person on the air bike. They'd have to yell Marine Corps. And if you didn't do that, there was like a penalty. So it was, it I just remember just, looking at y'all yeah. thinking, thank God I'm over here doing jujitsu and <laughs> not that air bike shit. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was cool. I had a blast uh, coaching uh, FYF uh, that, that night with the, uh, during the three-week internship. But it's so funny that we came full circle and, and now we're here. Here we are. Yes. So how did your government and just the culture – of people in the Netherlands, what happened when this COVID broke out? How did you guys deal with it? So when the whole Corona crisis or the the whole COVID thing developed, it was first, Italy was in full lockdown and uh, that was pretty nuts. In Spain, they had a different situation and every country in in Europe kind of treated it differently. Uh, and other, some, some countries, and I can't remember which one exactly, but some were like, like, yeah, we'll be fine. And it, they royally screwed the pooch. Others were like, eh, no, we're going on full lockdown. Uh, but that was like a, a little, uh, little late. And others were like very cautious and really tried to be smart in how to handle it. So I'm not saying the Netherlands is like the best country in the world, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy with how they handled it. They were, they were very cautious as well. Don't go by, don't just, you know, stroll out of the house you know if you need to do groceries that's fine but do it by yourself don't take the whole family obviously there was like the 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 six feet rule you know don't get too close no hugging no 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 open mouth kissing everybody you meet in the street you know just some some common Common sense sense. magical common sense yes The, the 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 superpower common sense that everybody should have but rarely uh, yeah uh, shows up and obviously you know gyms 
and saunas and sports clubs and you know clubs or bars they, they were closed they had to close restaurants they had to close so a lot of businesses were like holy shit we, we gotta be smart in how we handle this the government basically told us like you cannot do this 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 and this anymore everybody's got to wash their hands everybody's got to be smart and you're you have like the flu or you're sneezing or you're coughing can't leave the house gotta if, if you can't get tested uh, it, there were no mandatory tests but they were really like be smart and be social distance in the united states we kind yeah. of had that mindset for about four weeks mm -hmm. and then we <laughs> shit the bed when this started to develop before the political sharknado developed yeah. <laughs> in the in, in the states the whole firestorm uh you know with pirates and ninjas and lasers and shit was all going down in, in the states we were already beginning to take precautions in the netherlands so yeah and I, well I and understand. you guys are closer to the countries that well, were yeah, yeah. getting completely fucked so i think in yes in america we didn't see that it wasn't next door everything no, that happens in no. europe we don't take care. note until don't it's really here care. If you, if you get so much stuff hurled at you, you're going to go like, oh man, this is too much. Fuck this and yes. fuck this. Even, you know, even smart people might go like, man, this is oh, too yeah. much for me to handle. So, you know, I'm just going to make the best out of it. And then you might not make the best decisions. I'd say that's how we dealt with it. We were already like setting stuff in motion and we were, maybe it, that was kind of our luck because we got to see real up close what the neighboring countries were going through. And we were like, we got to not have this in our country and we, we gotta, gotta stop making out with people in the streets for a minute yes no free love the, the <laughs> last couple of months i mean we're very uh you know open-minded and stuff but you know we gotta keep the kissing to uh, kissing strangers to a minimum in the <laughs> yeah. last couple of months unfortunately mask it you up know. mask it up yeah yeah <laughs> yes yeah. yeah. i could send you some pics but you know yeah. we gotta leave that out of it. <laughs> exactly and eventually the gyms got to open up again and we're slowly doing that now but it's been a wild Wild couple of months. Uh, the, the Netherlands are more, I'd say, they don't get carried away real easy. You know, we'll be like, ah, we'll, we'll, we'll see. You know, it might all just blow over. Spoiler alert, it ne <laughs> did not just blow over. But, uh, but, <laughs> but, I was uh, talking to Art know, before, yeah. before this, and he's yeah. like, yeah, we all thought it was going to be a month. And I'm like, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. And here we are. Art is a smart guy, but you no, know, even Art got it wrong on this one. So now before all this shit went down, what was business like? What were you doing? Um, how was the business in your gym? Describe to yeah. everybody kind of, yeah, what you guys did and where everything was headed. The gym was going pretty well. Uh, we are a, uh, currently a performed better flagship gym here in the Netherlands. Um, so our gym was doing really well. About a year ago, we moved from a um, like 750 uh, square feet gym to what we have now, a 3,000 square feet gym. And it, it was looking pretty good uh, and still looking pretty good, by the way. So <laughs> I was co-running uh, Breda Strength and Conditioning along with Sana. Uh, we have uh, two coaches and uh, some personal trainers that you know, rent some space. Uh, we're doing small group training, small group classes, uh, personal training. Uh, we got some specialty programs going on. Um, we have about 180 members, pro athletes. Uh, I have a pro triathlete, um, the best triathlete, the, the Netherlands. And he really is. He's really, really good. Also, uh, a friend of mine, which I love. Uh, he's also my, my, my triathlon trainer. Uh, I got a guy. Um, he is not a pro athlete, but he is Brazilian jiu-jitsu, no-gi grappling guy. Was also, it? Is his name Dennis, the one with the puke yes. bucket? Yeah. Well, Dennis, yeah, Dennis, <laughs> Dennis likes to enjoy his meals twice. So, uh, <laughs> sometimes. Uh, yeah, Dennis, his nickname is the Wurkenburger. The, the, that means uh, the strangler out of Wurken, which is uh, the nickname of his town. Now I know uh, how I to pronounce it. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's yeah, it's a tongue twister. <laughs> then I got a pro, uh, pro BMX cyclist, uh, uh, Shanice. Uh, she's a pro BMXer. Uh, she came in seventh in the world championship. But also, it's not just you know pro athletes. We got students. We got you know GPP uh, people just want to you know work out and be fit and be healthy and no injuries. We got soccer moms. We got military and aspiring military uh, people. We got my mom who's turning seventy <laughs> in about two weeks. Yeah, and my mother-in-law. So it's it's we got like a whole plethora of awesome people you know working hard putting in effort so that was 
was what we were doing. We were doing pretty well. We were hosting seminars from um, a certified functional strength coach. We were hosting Jim Jones seminars. Uh, we were doing our own stuff, our specialty programs, military prep, strong women. Uh, we got a program called Pregnant and Fit. It was going really well. And then, well, <laughs> the, the, when the defecation hit the oscillation, that's when they, they closed everything down and you could get a fine. Like if you and me were standing too close together, you get like three or 400 euros. So that's about, that's a little more in, in, in dollars. You get that fine personally. And if you had a business and you were breaking the rules, that'd be 4,000 euros. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's like 43 or $4,400 fine. So that that's no joke. We got like small businesses that you could um, prove that you were negatively impacted by by the, uh, the sanctions, you could get a, a one-time, I think it was 4,000 that you could get. Like, like a loan? Yeah. Uh, no, 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 not a loan. It'd be like a, like a grant. Obviously, I, I wanted to still be open, but not at the cost of you know health and security for, yeah. for people that might be uh, uh, infected in a, or, or affected in a bad way. But the 4,000, that's not a lot. I think no. we lost well over like 15,000 euros in, in revenue. For yeah. in the last couple of months, if, if, if maybe even more, maybe it'd be like five thousand a month. So that'd be like twenty five thousand that we lost, maybe in revenue. And so, for, what for did you time. do during this time to kind of forge yeah. ahead? So we were in a talk. Uh, I, I was with uh, in, a, in a Zoom call. It was like a, a big group Zoom call uh, with Dan and Joe from Forest City House Gym. They had like, like I think it was like twenty five people as it were in the Zoom call, and some Jim Jones instructors and some other people that I was following uh, through social media but never met, never met. in real yeah. life. So it was pretty cool. I, I met a couple of people. And I was like, oh shit, I've been following this guy for like years. And, and yeah. then, like <laughs> while we were in the call, I was like sending him like a DM going like. You're the man, uh, that was Zach <laughs> Hanesh from uh, Underground Strength Gym. I was like, man, you're one of the OGs. I remember buying some of his training programs. I was like, oh shit, I'm in the same <laughs> call with this guy. But with some of the stuff that Dan and Joe really hit the nail on the head was being proactive, taking charge and, and leading uh, for your members. You know, you, you have to show them that you care. You have to not sit on your ass and go like, well, I can't do gym stuff because the gym's closed. Uh, so what we did, we called every single one of our members and explained what the situation was. Before we did that, we sent out an email the same night that the government told us gyms can't be open. So we put out an email and shared programming. We started Zoom classes and that they could sign in. And in, in the newsletters, I would tell the people programming that we were going to do. The program was strength and conditioning. Uh, I did programming for running. So people that wanted to start running could start. Uh, I did like absolute beginners run training and also some advanced. We did a weekly newsletter. Every week we did a weekly webinar and Son and I would alternate and she would take a, a pick up a topic and I would pick a topic. Uh, we did a weekly Q&A on Instagram Live, a material sign out so people could come in and they could sign for uh, a dumbbell, a kettlebell, or an elastic band, whatever, whatever they wanted to use. And we basically just kept them busy with a ton of online content, basically smack all the members over the head with so much content that they could you know, read or listen to. And what I wanted, what we wanted to do was still be a constant, dependable something that people could rely on so they could work out and not be trapped in their head. Because in the first like four weeks, you're, gonna, you're like, eh, you know, people were getting day drunk and you know, whatever. <laughs> exactly. I got day drunk. It was kind of a vacation there. at first. It was a vacation. Yeah. But, you know, and, and uh, just to be real, I know you and, and you know uh, me too, uh, we take, we make jokes, but you and I, we both put a lot of emphasis in mental wellness. And some people really battle some demons in the last couple of uh, months because all of a sudden you're being forced into this conversation with yourself because you are not allowed some of the, um, you know, the stuff to, to distract you. So all of a sudden you're like, man, I am drinking a lot or man, yes. I am, you know, uh, struggling with some stuff in my past or man, I am really in an unhealthy relationship with myself or with other people. Yeah, and, and absolutely. Being, a lot of things you had to face <laughs> head on when you didn't have that outlet. You take away that habit from me and I realize, oh, I'm actually kind of on a tenuous uh, ledge here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I'm really uh, I'm doing this the whole balancing act. Something I always um, admired about you as I, you know, watched you on social media and we had conversations. You were always reading new books or fixing up your gym or kind of finding new ways to deal with the old shit. And I just thought that resilience within you was pretty fucking cool. What were the personal steps you were taking for your business and yourself? Yeah, that's, um, well, first of all, thank you for saying that. I kind of, we kind of had to because you can drive yourself nuts, you know, just obsessing over the stuff that you cannot do. One of the, um, I'd say, positive outlets for me was like, okay, I can really step up my game when it comes to reading books. I wanted to work on being able to listen more intently. I was like devouring these, all these books. I was reading like a book a week. Could be Stoicism, which I really <laughs> love to read about and practice because as you can tell, I'm very all over the place with a lot of energy. Stoicism really helped me with, you know, reframing some stuff. Uh, read a ton of great Stoic books on Stoicism, which I've, which I've always loved, The Daily Stoic, uh, Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, uh, Stillness is the Key, and those three books I really recommend for people that enjoy Stoicism. So Daily Stoic, Meditations, and uh, Stillness is the Key. So that was just on mindset, and it felt very timely to read about that. Viktor Frankl's uh, Man's Search for Meaning, I read From Good to Great. I've read uh, stuff on negotiation from uh, Never Split the Difference. Um, I've read Atomic Habits. The one thing, and, and I think if people are interested in creating new habits, I'd say Atomic Habits and The One Thing, uh, that's, like a, that's like a great combination. What, what I did was I would put it into practice because obviously, you know, reading a book is like having a weight, but it's just sitting on the floor. You have to pick up the weights and get go on with it. I'd read the book, then I'd read the summary, then I would take away three of the, the biggest things that I've learned from it and put it into practice. And just, you know, try and be somewhat normal in this very unusual time where you have your own business and you're trying to over deliver to all your awesome members, keep people engaged, you know, call and text and DM and message all, kind of, all, all your members, all your awesome people, and still try to develop yourself and the business and stay calm. So I had to do stuff like that. And I'm pretty sure that if I didn't do something positive, I would do something negative because it's real easy to just sit on your ass and drink booze. Uh, yeah, it is. <laughs> you know, so it's kind of fun too, but you know, that's definitely It's not, not though. After a while, it's fucking not. Yes. We're not out of the woods yet, but definitely developed some great positive habits from from this uh, whole situation and where are you now your gym is open right and it's yes. fucking beautiful <laughs> thank you i mean it, it really is it's very impressive space um what's what's going on now so we are allowed to be open again still six feet of distancing you know and like i said we're, we're, everybody wants to come back into the gym so our, our fundamentals program our good to go program uh, that's up and running it's fully booked you know um and next month is looking full as well like it's almost full as well we have classes of no more than 12 people at our gym and everybody has like a couple of square feet that's all mapped out like it looks like a big pac-man game or it looks yeah. like a, a level <laughs> so you guys of, taped of, it out and everything yes yes uh, nice. with black and yellow tape it looks pretty cool actually uh on the floor and it looks like a a, a level of mario kart uh, on acid <laughs> But uh, it's still, uh, it, it, everybody has their own station. Everybody has like four kettlebells, a barbell, a pull-up station, a slam ball, an ab mat, a dumbbell, a plyo box. And they all have at their own station, they have like hand sanitizer gel and like some, some paper towels that they can use afterwards. And, uh, and, we, and we coach the hell out of them. Before you can register, you have to check off some of the stuff and it says, I am, I don't have any symptoms. I'm not sneezing. I'm not coughing. I don't have a, the flu or whatever you, we have that. And obviously when they come in, you have to use the hand sanitizing gel and everybody has their designated areas where you stand. So there's no touching, no contact yeah. whatsoever. Well, and I feel with the fact that you have worked so hard in maintaining a family atmosphere, you individually <laughs> called all of your clients. I think any of them would probably not want to lie on that questionnaire. And they have so much stuff that they can work 
uh, at home themselves. So yeah, they're, they're definitely, uh, yeah, cause I, I don't think you would get that with a big gym or with certain no. gyms where you just feel like another number. And I no. think people would be like, well, I don't feel really good, but I just, I'll just pop in. I need <laughs> no, to work yeah. out. No, 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 definitely. We know, I, I like to say, uh, uh like, uh, in, in, in a humble way that I know the name of everybody who comes through the door and see like, hey, you got a haircut, or hey, she's got new shoes, or hey, uh, how'd that thing go with the job, or, or whatever. We have a very tightly knit uh, group of people. You know, um, even when I was, I had like a stomach flu a couple of weeks ago, but we did, didn't really know what was going on. So I got tested for coronavirus myself. And, I was, and we were like, okay, so I can't coach right now. It was just like three days. And it happened to be uh, not the coronavirus, probably it was stomach flu. But it wouldn't be very good if I had all these rules and demanded the people to adhere to those rules and then me myself not adhere to the rules in my own gym. So yeah, yeah it's kind of it's kind of tough. But we were I was lucky that didn't have didn't have the coronavirus. But uh, yeah, <laughs> thank God. <laughs> a big theme here is yeah. common sense and yes. a really good community that supports each other and just actually gives a shit about each other. Imagine that. <laughs> yeah, that'd right? be, yeah, that'd be great if everybody, and that's how we see it with ourselves, with our family, with Sana and I and Aileen and Odin or uh, Odin the dog, is like, if we just take care of each other and use some common sense and help out people as best we can, then also do that with Breda Strength and Conditioning, take care of our people, try and be there for them. You know, if, if we all do that together, we'll be fine. You know, don't be an asshole. And uh, remember that it's a special time for you, but also for your neighbor and for everybody else. So if we, if we just can be a little bit more, you know, uh, compassionate or with a little, little bit more relaxed, not relaxed like you don't care, but be like, just give somebody, everybody else literally and figuratively more, a little bit more space, a little bit more room. You know, maybe read a couple of books on mindset or stoicism. You'll be fine. You know, rest can save you. Just, you know, chill out everybody and use some common sense and some brotherly or sisterly love and we'll be all right. Yeah. That's what well, some hippie bullshit that I see. Yeah. That you know about. <laughs> it's all right. I know better. Fuck, we finally got a minute. I know, because like obviously we've known each other on Instagram for years, but it's like, oh my God, I feel like I'm on a phone call with you. It's amazing. It's funny, like the internet makes you feel so close, you know, to people. Yeah. And you realize, wow, I've never even spoken to that person. It's very interesting. It is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so rounding out these interviews, I'm here with KP of KP After Hours. KP is a health coach who lives in England, and her focus is on anti-diet and health at any size based movements. Um, and we're here because she's had a really interesting pivot into OnlyFans to make ends meet during this crazy COVID clusterfuck. Um, first, why don't you tell Hi. us about your, your coaching gig and your experience and your education before we get into all of that? I qualified as a fitness instructor about five years ago and I began coaching um, beginners in a park. It was a community class. It was very low cost. We only used to charge like a one pound donation and it was just to get people into fitness. I was doing that alongside an office job and I finally left in 2016. I knew that I wanted to do something different and I loved fitness anyway. So it just felt like the natural thing to do. You know, I wanted to help people discover their joy of fitness too. And so the fitness instruction evolved into personal training. However, that was where I became a bit stuck because I was already going through a transition of learning more about body positivity. And I was moving away from diet culture myself. So then when I got a casual job in a gym and was told that I'd have to weigh clients, take measurements, do before and after photos, and also, in quotation marks, look the part myself, mm -hmm. <laughs> I realised that this industry just was not going to be for me. So I think I only had two personal training clients before I gave that up and decided to go to university to get a degree yes. at the age of 36. <laughs> <laughs> what we learn as a personal trainer is so basic. And I knew there was more to health 
than what I've been told. If you, if you don't know anything about fitness and you get a personal trainer, just how little most of those people know, and they're all giving you the same basic shit, the same basic as, as they call it, bro science yeah. and bullshit. And they don't really have any education or experience to tell you these things, but we believe it yeah. anyway. A lot of people will use even the science, you know, of, well, move more, eat less. And they think that that's all that you need to do. And they will stick to that. Calories in, calories out. That's all that, that you know, they put people in this box. And what happens to the people where that doesn't work? Mm -hmm. or where that can't work or where that may lead to an unhealthy and disordered relationship with food so I just thought that the fitness industry although although it claims that it's inclusive and empowering it's actually very exclusionary and it's not very empowering for people who don't fit inside the very small five percent box (laughs) yes I was gonna say that's a huge percentage of people I'm interested in holistic health more so, and I'm interested in still supporting people to engage in fitness, but in a way that is empowering and not disempowering, because this is what I was beginning to feel, that the fitness industry was actually disempowering. I had my own experience with toxic gym culture. Um, You know, I was was team go hard, go home. I was team no excuses. Um, I was team, if I can do it, you can do it. You know, um, I was working out six times a week, I was doing martial arts. I was training for like 90 minutes per session. And then my world collapsed and I started having problems with my eldest son at the time. I was a single parent, so I had limited support at home. Suddenly I couldn't make the classes. I was having to skip classes because obviously being at home was more important at that time. And I was labeled as a slacker of letting my team down. I was outed from the gym, really. And I think that was my defining moment. My perspective began to change. So it took it, something happening to me personally for me to actually understand and believe people who don't always have the time, who may have very valid reasons, you know, who may not want to even exercise to that extent. So I had a bit of a bump back down to earth. Um, to set me on the path of like discovering how we have to make it flexible do you know what I mean to fit oh yeah well health isn't just being fit and being sexy it encompasses everything and some people are actually healthier at a heavier weight there are so many things that go into your total health and that's not just abs exactly like at that time if you I don't like to say best shape because I don't actually agree with them being a best shape but if we were looking in athletic terms, I had an athletic physique. You know, I was extremely cardiovascular fit, but yet I was probably the unhealthiest I'd ever been. And my whole family dynamic was completely out of whack. So yeah, it, I realized that the fitness industry actually was very unhealthy. Something else that began to open my eyes in, in regards to beginning to work in, in a gym and be within the gym environment was how deceptive actually people's appearances can be and what they put out there but what's really going on in Ooh, regards yes. to yeah <laughs> any time spent in a gym with these people and yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, it's because I was naive I was new to all this you know I, I'd only ever been part of commercial gyms and I used to do the Les Mills body combat I'd do my class and go out but then I you know I joined more smaller independent gyms and you begin to see more things that go on and so that was where I discovered a lot of people use performance enhancement drugs and no shade on any of that by the way I think people are entitled to make those choices for themselves but unfortunately these aren't nobody talks about it openly and so and so people think those results are just normal and natural yeah yeah. yeah, exactly. That nobody talks about the fat burners and you know the um, the steroids. I was beginning to see one side of things, and then the side that's put out to the public, and and it was the same people that were saying, "If I can do it, you can do it." You know, exactly. Um, and I'm like, "What? Yeah, what? if and I could do it on steroids, you could do it on steroids." Yeah. <laughs> So, so it all began to unravel for me. And I was like, no, I don't want to be part of this. It feels really toxic. And at the same time, because of everything that was going on in my personal life, I actually lost my job of 15 years. I'd been diagnosed with anxiety and depression a long time ago, but 
because of stuff that had been going on at home basically became too much to manage and I had to take some time off work because of the amount of time they could no longer support my absence so I actually found myself unemployed in 2016 I didn't know what I would do with my family life and trying to get a new job with with everything so unpredictable because typically it's put on the woman to you know raise the kids and you're just like holy shit I'm 15 years behind yeah and there was like you know no partner to do shifts with and be like (laughs) okay can you go and collect in this time you know because basically my son kept going missing and um every time he went missing I would have to inform the police so I had to be at home And I just couldn't imagine trying to get a new job and then having to say, oh, sorry, I'm going to have to leave. I've got to go and call the police because my son's gone missing again. Yeah. (laughs) And obviously it was such a worrying time because the whole time that we didn't know where he was, I was just a complete anxious mess. You know, it's one of those times where I really did have to prioritise my children. At this moment in time, I, I literally could only focus on my son. So for the first time in my life, I was actually an unemployed single parent one of my friends suggested going to university and I have to be honest it's not something that I've ever thought I'd be able to do so I applied for university and I and I got in nice (laughs) and that was it was so amazing you know I was 36 I was uh, I went full-time as well I was the oldest one in my cohort everybody was like 20 21 um but I loved it I absolutely loved the university experience and um, I came away with a 2-2 in health and exercise, exercise and health, a degree in exercise and health. Um, I, I thought I could do better than a 2-2, but I lost my mum suddenly in 2017. And I, I've, after that point, I probably was only at university about 10% of the time. So I feel very lucky to even scrape through with, um, you know, a second class degree. And I thought, you know, I have to dedicate this degree to my mom um, and I have to finish it for her because she was there when I, you know, it was because of her that I was able to start it. So that was probably my driving point that I can't quit. I can't come as far and quit. So yes, I, I graduated at 39. And then I found health at every size, which I describe it as an alternative approach to health. And it's about promoting health behaviours rather than the health outcomes. outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. What I found in a lot of the studies is there was, you know, there was a lot of um, correlation between not people who lost weight, but it was people who was eating more fruit and vegetables, who was getting more physical activity, who Mm -hmm. was sleeping better, who weren't smoking, you know, who drank less alcohol. So to me, health at every size is a way to access health. I I describe it as like an individual experience because health means something different to us all. You know, like a person with a chronic illness is going to be completely different to somebody who's, you know, illness free. And I don't think the mainstream fitness industry even considers those things. Everybody will come in and they'll be like, I want to look hot. Yeah. Because that's what they think they want because that's what Mm -hmm. they're told they want but that's not really what people want (laughs) I mean people just want to be happy and functional and healthy I mean exactly (laughs) so so, because that's why you we have to try and move away don't we and like you say it's it's based on an unrealistic and often unattainable standards without restriction or without disorder or without enhancement you know Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's about what we can do, isn't it, Liz? What we can do and what we can access. Like, you know, our needs change, don't they, over time. Um, And I I think that's what we've got to learn to do, be flexible and be fluid and have a lot of variety and be able to access different things when we need them. How was business going? How was your coaching business going? I think I launched it in December. I got um, a couple of clients. I had some clients come with me for free, like to try and get, some experience but then I got my first pain clients in January and it was so amazing and then I got dumped (laughs) at the beginning of January (laughs) completely out of the blue so that rocked my world so that was number one and then Covid hit in was the um mid mid March I think when it started Mm -hmm. when it got going when it got worrying yeah and so then my business just took a nosedive because I think it was the 20th of March over here, all the gyms closed and all of a sudden everybody was an online personal trainer giving free 
workouts you know yeah and not yeah so not only did the industry become saturated overnight I also I was an anxious mess at the beginning of of lockdown it was awful so KP after hours correct me if I'm wrong but it started you you kind of had this sort of renaissance with your sexuality and that just started getting going right before all the activism came up and you kind of put that on on hold for a minute yeah you came back to it and you went professional (laughs) (laughs) so that's with a bit of a bang (laughs) yeah yeah so tell me what made you you know how did you come to that decision to say fuck it let's do this so my, my sexual liberation started after an abusive relationship I had a lot of sexual trauma he took so much from me that I didn't want him to take back to so I was already kind of like you know getting rid of all these um, hang-ups that, that I had and I'd, I'd started to embrace my own sexuality and then what started the page with um, KP After Hours was I'm, I'm in a bigger body now than I've ever been and I wanted to feel sexy and I'd been dumped <laughs> so mm-hmm. I, I, I ordered some very nice underwear from um, a company and it came just before Valentine's Day because I was going to order it it's Valentine's Day you know and I was oh. like Do you know what I'm ordering it for myself <laughs> And I'm still going to wear it. And when I put it on, I was just in shock at how, how sexy I look. And <laughs> I took these pictures and I just wanted to share, share these pictures with the world. So that's how KT After Hours started. And then with the hit with the income, I just thought, why not get paid for doing something that I absolutely really enjoy? And, I, you know, I've followed sex workers for years, especially as I'm going through all the social justice stuff. And I've always felt really inspired by them. Um, so... I just decided to give it a go. I'm just going to give it a go. And here we are. Go you do. (laughs) Yes. So are you happy with the go that you've given it? Yes. It's hard work. (laughs) But it's also very enjoyable. I I think maybe I didn't realise how hard it was going to be, I must say. Because, you know, you only see the the glamorous side, don't you? You don't see what goes on behind the scenes. And it's hard work. It's tiring. You have to constantly be advertising yourself as well. But... I find it really enjoyable and it's probably something that I will keep on the sides because it's not just about making the money. I I suppose it's about showing myself and other people that you can be older and in a larger body and still be sexual. I've only been on there a month. I've, I've got no prediction of how it may go, but it's, let's just put it as like, it helps towards me buying groceries, which is, supportive for me right now I do feel like I missed the window of opportunity when everyone was in lockdown because I kind of started at the end you know and people are returning back to in quotation marks normality um, well uh people KP, are to I've got to news work. for you I think there's going to be another lockdown coming soon <laughs> well the way because we cannot yeah, get yeah. our shit together do you know that we're the third I think we're the country the third highest death toll so we're not doing much better it's not much to be proud of <laughs> no no, <laughs> not at no. and what's your experience like but to be fair I've had a really good experience so far everyone on the OnlyFans has been really respectful really polite and um, you know there's, there's been a couple of requests for in person but like I explained I don't do full service I'm staying online and that was fine you know they accepted it without argument or without like I haven't met any rudeness yet I don't know it's been expensive worse of people but I've actually been shocked that everyone is, is actually being really nice and polite and lovely I have a, had a different experience on my Instagram with yes. um, you know unsolicited dick pics and um, people wanting to like sext me in my DMs whereas like I charge for that over on OnlyFans <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I, I talk a lot about consent you know rape culture I talk about racism Whilst we're talking about it, uh, can I share my experience with dick pics and how they make me feel? I actually feel extremely violated when I get an unsolicited one. I'm not a prude, you know, I love dick, but I don't like it non-consensually. And I actually get a physiological response. I go hot. I feel embarrassed. I feel a little bit nauseous. My instinct actually is just completely to block them straight away. It's like an instinct reaction. I just want them gone. So when these men send these pictures and think that I don't know what they think they're doing, 
but to me I feel violated and I feel threatened by them I don't they make me feel very unsafe so yeah just putting it out there guys that dick pics sent unsolicited really don't do it for us yeah for really anybody I yeah. you know and that's the thing is I just I really don't understand that at all. I'm not sure if it's because guys are so, you know, visual. They're just, no offense guys, but you're really dumb for (laughs) a picture of, you know, a naked body part. Um, And women generally don't have that same sexual reaction to just a random naked body part. Um, Do they think that they're turning us on are they trying to shock us like is it some weird thing and I hate to say pornography culture because that makes me sound (laughs) like a prude but there is a certain culture of people that watch a little too much porn that kind of get this idea we're just all these you know women that have it we have our sexuality just locked yeah. deep inside of us and you need to pound it out you know, or whatever you know and so they have this idea of how to turn women on or I, I don't know I don't fucking get well, it at all like, there's a part of me it's a bit dark and I think I do think sometimes it is an extension of rape culture it's that I don't care if you want this or not you're gonna get it like do you know what I mean I don't care I'm not gonna ask you if you want to see this or not I don't care about your consent I don't care if you want this I want to so I want you to I want to give it to you I'm yeah. going to give it to you so to me it feels like an extension of rape culture which is probably why I have such a, a response to it yeah mm-hmm. so I, I, I know not every man may send it with those intentions but that's how it feels yeah I yeah, think so well I think most men don't understand we're usually letting somebody into our home and men are just walking into doors and going into people's homes. So there's just the dynamic is off. And I don't think- It's just entitlement, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. They're walking into a door, we are hosting them, (laughs) so Mm -hmm. to speak. And, you know, I I was telling my uh, group of girlfriends the other day, I said, you know what? I think every man needs to get pegged so he understands. Because there is an inherent violence if you don't- approach that door correctly you know what I'm saying Mm -hmm, and they don't understand how women receive pleasure I think so I try to you know I try to balance it out like okay I'm gonna give some of these guys the benefit of the doubt because they don't understand why we feel threatened but then a lot of it is I'm not gonna give these guys the benefit of the fucking doubt because they're marching around like dicks and somebody needs to tell them yeah the last one I got I would let him in as a follower within 10 minutes he'd sent me this picture so without even looking for any of my posts without engaging in me with me sorry like you know without getting to know the feel of my page he just saw me as a naked woman I'm gonna send her my dick you know and it's like no you're gone And also, I think it's the whole, like, um, you know, they don't want to pay. They don't want to pay, so they're just going to try and get what they can for free. We're we're okay with consuming those images for free, but when it comes to us wanting, you know, compensation or payment for Mm -hmm. our work, um, people seem to have a problem with that. So I feel like this this whole situation has shown this huge light on what a fucking house of cards we're all sitting on yeah just how completely unprotected 75 percent of just the world population is the rest of us are marginally protected and then of course you have the upper five people that just nothing can reach them yeah those of us down here i mean we're all kind of struggling and everybody does everybody expects things for free now especially Mm -hmm. online because like you said there is such a glut of free shit whether it's free workouts free pussy free dick Mm -hmm. free people are just giving it away so it sets this standard and if none of us can make money doing anything anymore what the fuck are we gonna do next i know what do we what do we do Exactly, because like, you know, I'm in a lot of debt for my education and this is why I I do the online stuff because it's a way for me to try and become financially independent and earn my own money, but on my own terms and to support, like this is part of me supporting my health. One good thing with COVID and lockdown is that it's taught us that we can do a hell of a lot of stuff online actually. You know, I've been talking to a lot of coaches and gym owners this week and I really feel like for the first time, I mean, 
people can reach out to those with mental illness. They can reach out mm -hmm. to those with disabilities. People with all different situations have so many more opportunities now to get in touch with health and fitness coaches to work yeah. out in an affordable way as well. Mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of forced it's everybody to reinvent themselves, which is pretty neat, really. Yeah. And it's made fitness accessible in a different way. You know, like you say, not everybody can get to the gym. It's definitely opened up a, a different kind of world, I do think. Oh, absolutely. I, it, it's been really interesting. And I think even what you do um, with, you know, the sex work side of things, mm -hmm. the way you do it, that is a part of health. That's a huge part of health. Sexual health is something people totally neglect. We're so fucking yeah. focused on abs that we don't understand how much stress having negative sexual thoughts and feelings can affect mm -hmm. the whole picture, especially for women that don't have, you know, what they call it, straight-sized bodies now, right? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, especially, and men and trans and, you know, everybody in between. And it's giving everybody permission to be beautiful and to be sexual and to own it. Exactly. And that's a huge part of mental and physical health that I think people exactly. don't understand. Everybody's so focused on the diet, the, the move more mm -hmm. and the eat less. And they're running around having horrible sex and feeling like shit. Like... You know, yeah. <laughs> there's, it, it's not just one thing. So I love how you reinvented yourself. You know, I completely support you. I think what you're doing is really great work. And I hope that you continue to make some cash off of it because you definitely deserve it. <laughs> You've been through a lot Thank of shit. You. you do a lot of really great work. You always inspire me and you're moving us all forward, KP. <laughs> oh, thanks, Liz. And do you know you're what? I think it's just about that, isn't it? Just being open to evolving and when we know better we do better health and fitness and wellness it just it goes beyond diet and exercise usually it has foundations in your economic situation and the pressures of your social culture and mm -hmm. these things that we just sort of treat as extraneous when really they're fundamental so i think people like you are totally ahead of the curve when it comes to that I absolutely wish you the best, and I hope that while it is a job, and we all know, yes. because people think, oh, you just get to fuck all day. It's like, uh, do you really want that, though? No, you don't. You know, sometimes you got other shit to do. It's kind of nice to talk about it. Yeah. So thanks for having me. There are good things to come out of this year. Flexibility, an individualized approach, new technology, and an awareness of how our culture and our social structure actually affects our health. But we still have some scrambling to do when it comes to compensation and being financially stable. This is not a lucrative career if you're not a celebrity hawking supplements and gear, or if you're not lucky enough to have a bit of your paid content take off. It's really the Wild West out there right now. And we're running, and we're climbing, and we're dodging, and we're weaving to make it all work. But that's what fitness is about, isn't it? Rising to the challenge, and being able to adapt and evolve as you play the game. I hope you enjoyed listening to these coaches as much as I did. And if you're interested in any of them, check out their links in the description. So we'll see you next time for more real-ass people talking about their real-ass lives.